You have been shown a muscle-bound megalodon for years. What if the real giant was sleek, long, and built like a supersized lemon shark? Today, we put the white shark look-alike to rest and reveal the vertebrae-driven model that redefines this apex predator. We will unpack the Belgian spine that stretches an 11.1 meter trunk, the cross-species comparisons across 145 living and 20 extinct shark species, and why hydrodynamics make a bulky mega shark impossible at this scale. Stay to see how a longer body, a longer gut and endothermy powered a cruising giant and how those same features may have helped doom it, starting with the wrong giant. Which brings us to the main problem, the wrong giant. For years, you were told the easy story scale, up a great white and you get Megalodon. Big conical head barrel chest, massive tail, just more of the same. That version grew out of what we had teeth the size of your hand and a habit of borrowing the body of laminid sharks to fill in the missing pieces. Toys, CGI, and museum art followed suit because sharp teeth in a torpedo shape feel like a safe bet when bones are scarce. But bones are not entirely absent. When vertebrae show up, they start vetoing the guesswork. A standout line of vertebrae from Belgium does exactly that. The column preserves an 11.1 meter trunk, not a whole animal, just the core section that runs from behind the head to before the tail. That number is awkward if you want a compact powerhouse because a trunk that long stretches everything else with its head position, dorsal fin anchor points, and where the tail has to begin. Stack those rings and you do not get a squat profile. You get length you cannot hide. Vertebrae matter because they set hard limits. The trunk length is not negotiable once those centra are counted and measured. Fins attach around specific vertebral counts and muscles have to span those distances to deliver power without wasting energy. If the trunk grows, the spacing of the fins stretches with it and the body plan must follow or the swimmer becomes unstable. Proportions stop being a stylistic choice and become engineering. That case did not rest on one lab either. An international team of 29 experts from multiple countries brought datasets, comparative methods, and independent checks to bear on the Belgian column and similar material. Now take a simple test. Take a great whites outline and just extend it end to end. Keep the same thickness and pretend the water would not care. At big sizes, water cares. Form drag shoots up when cross-sectional area stays high relative to length and the cost of cruising skyrockets. You can add muscle, but then you add more oxygen demand and more heat loss from a larger surface. You get a loop of diminishing returns where longer strokes push more water the wrong way. To break out of that loop, researchers compared body layouts across a widespread of sharks' 145 living species plus 20 extinct ones. The point was not to pick a favorite look, but to map where heads and tails typically land relative to the vertebral trunk. That cross-species grid shows clear patterns as sharks scale certain fin placements, and body tapers keep drag manageable and stability high. Pack too much volume mid-body at giant sizes, and you move outside the stable zone those data. The vertebral trunk marks where the mechanical core sits. Proportional head and tail extensions are then bounded by what works across the data set. There's the contradiction. A lamnid-style barrel taken past 20 meters collides with what large swimmers tend to solve for low form drag, smooth transitions, and a tail position to work in clean flow. The thick midsection that works in a few meter predator becomes a liability when you multiply the length several times and ask the same thrust cycle to keep pace. The vertebrae from Belgium with their set trunk distance point away from the stocky sketch and toward a hull that spreads volume along the body instead of concentrating it. So if the standard great white template falls apart at scale, which shark actually helps? You do not need a faster, bulkier sprinter. You need a form that cruises efficiently and saves power for short accelerations. That pushes the search towards sharks with more uniform bodies where fin spacing stays consistent and the cross section narrows smoothly toward the tail. Look for a blueprint that keeps flow attached and avoids big turbulent wakes around the midline. The mini payoff is clear enough. White shark analogs at this size become highly questionable, not because the animal was not powerful, but because the skeleton insists on a leaner outline. The vertebral map forces a longer, sleeker trunk with fins and tail set for steadier travel. Step away from the myth and toward the model, and the right stand and starts to stand out one whose shape sets a clean baseline for what comes next. Here's the answer. The lemon shark body plan wins because its layout scales cleanly with what the vertebrae demand. 
So how does a coastal lemon shark end up as the best stand-in for the ocean's largest macro predator start with its shape? Lemon sharks carry a uniform elongated body with steady fin spacing from snout to tail and that regularity acts like a hydrodynamic baseline. The head does not balloon, the midsection does not barrel out, and the tail meets the flow with fewer abrupt changes in thickness. When you scale that kind of layout, the water sees a long, clean hull rather than a bulky middle that kicks off turbulence. You might expect a giant to follow the torpedo stereotype thick at the center with a sharp taper. Researchers found something different when they mapped proportions against the measured trunk, a long svelte cruiser that favors steady travel with short controlled bursts. The test was not about taste. It relied on vertebral trunk length as the ruler and then used patterns from 145 living and 20 extinct shark species to estimate how far the head and tail extend beyond that trunk. That framework turns a row of centra into a workable 3D outline without inflating any single region. Here is where the lemon shark starts to win. Lamnid-type bodies concentrate mass around the mid-body to feed fast accelerations, and that works at moderate sizes. Lemon-like forms spread volume along the length, thinning the cross-section and smoothing the flow. At a giant scale spreading volume trims form, drag keeps the boundary layer attached longer and lets the tail operate in cleaner water. The dorsal and pectoral fins sit where they stabilize the trunk, instead of fighting the wake of a swollen belly. Slender bodies pay off in the swim style that follows. Lower form drag means you can hold a cruise without burning through fuel, and the tail can deliver efficient, repeatable beats instead of hauling a barrel across the water. That aligns with a predator built for long-distance movement between feeding grounds and brief intercepts when the timing is right. No need for marathon chases. You track position and commit to a short closing sprint. Estimated cruising speeds of roughly 1.3 to 2.2 miles per hour fit that strategy slow, steady travel punctuated by planned accelerations. The numbers sit within that logic. The Belgian vertebral column maps to a total length near 53.8 feet, already a giant, but not the ceiling. Larger vertebrae from Denmark about 9.1 inches across push the upper bound to roughly 79.7 feet. Crucially, that 79.7 foot figure is the largest possible reasonable estimate supported by the current record. Mass scales with that extreme too, the around 94 ton value belongs at the top end near 79.7 feet, not as a typical adult. Shift the outline from muscle-bound monster to an elegant long-range hunter, and the new behavior makes sense. Efficient cruising punctuated by controlled speed, bursts to intercept prey replaces the image of constant high-speed pursuit. Stretch the frame and the rest of the system must meet the same standard, how to make heat manage fuel, and move that energy through a very long body without wasting it. So if the body stretched out and trimmed bulk, what kept that machine running across entire seas start with heat? Evidence points to regional endothermy in megalodon, warmer core regions, and swimming muscles compared with the water around it. That thermal boost supports quicker muscle contraction, steadier cruising at low cost, and faster post-meal processing. Keep the red muscle and viscera warm and you shorten the time food sits in the gut, which matters when each meal is a multi-hundred kilogram package of fat and protein. There's a catch. Generating and retaining heat costs energy, and at a giant size, the bill arrives every day. UK not afford to waste. That is where the longer frame pays a second dividend inside the body cavity. A longer body allows a longer alimentary canal, more length, more folds, and more absorptive surface. The payoff is simple, squeeze, more calories out of every kilogram of blubber and muscle, and you reduce how often you must hunt. Large marine mammals deliver the right mix here. Blubber carries dense lipids, skeletal muscle brings protein, and both fit a strategy of steady travel, punctuated by brief accelerations to intercept. Hydrodynamics connects the outside to the inside, Skin covered in placoid scales creates micro ridges that manage flow at high Reynolds numbers. That texture reduces skin friction and keeps the boundary layer attached longer along a slender hull so the tail works in cleaner water. Less drag means the heat budget stretches further and the gut can work without the engine revving all day to overcome turbulence. Life history lines up with this energy math. Vertebral growth records indicate very large newborns around 11.8 to 12.8 feet long produced by mothers who fed embryos by intrauterine egg eating. Fewer, bigger offspring cost more upfront. 
but they enter the ocean already past the smallest, most vulnerable stages. That investment matches a top predator with long intervals between successful hunts and a need to keep juvenile mortality low. Put the parts together. A leaner profile lowers form, drag regional endothermy keeps muscles, and the digestive tract on a warm, efficient schedule, and an extended gut extracts more energy per meal. That triad yields a workable budget for a roughly 65-foot hunter that cruises at modest speeds and spends energy selectively. It only functions, though, as long as the environment supplies warm coast reliable nurseries and calorie-rich prey moving through reachable waters. What happens when your engine is perfect for yesterday's ocean, not tomorrow's? The Pliocene starts to cool and the rules shift. Warm, shallow continental shelves contract as sea surface temperatures dip and seasonal upwelling strengthens along many coasts. Those broad protected margins that once served as nurseries tighten into patchy pockets. At the same time, major whale lineages steer their migrations toward cooler latitudes and more productive temperate belts following blooms of krill and small fish into waters that stay chilly most of the year. Megalodon's regional endothermy gave it a thermal edge over purely cold-blooded fish, but the range likely lagged behind smaller competitors that tolerate stronger temperature swings. Running warm helps muscles and digestion, yet it increases the energy bill in cold water and narrows where you can operate efficiently. As the climate trended cooler, that trade-off got harsher. The best hunting lanes shifted poleward while the safest rearing grounds for pups thinned out along shrinking warm coasts. Competition sharpened the pressure. Zinc isotope data point to diet overlap with early great whites a clear sign of resource conflict rather than simple coexistence. If both predators keyed in on similar marine mammals, every carcass mattered and the smaller, more cold-tolerant hunter could shadow prey farther into temperate and even subpolar zones. That advantage compounds when prey are moving and the bigger animal pays more to keep its muscles and gut running hot. The result was a double hit. Fewer warm nurseries cut recruitment and prey shifting poleward shaved down adult foraging success. Coastal models that track habitat through cooling intervals show repeated contractions of suitable shallow warm areas, and proposed nursery sites line up with that trend. By around 3.6 million years ago, the pattern stops looking like a brief swing and becomes persistent stress. The cafeteria moved north, the daycare shrank at home, great whites handled the new map better. They function well in colder seas, track whales along temperate routes and mature in climates that stayed productive as fronts intensified. A giant optimized for warm, broad coasts lost ground on both fronts at once. Fewer recruits, tighter ranges, and direct dietary competition create the kind of long squeeze that drains even a well-tuned system, which brings us to the larger rule that decides who gets to be enormous in the open ocean. Gigantism thrives only when body shape, propulsion, heat, and food align with climate. Hydrodynamics sets the size ceiling while metabolism and prey distribution determine who reaches it. Current evidence suggests Megalodon was a long streamlined cruiser rather than a barrel-bodied sprinter. Until more complete fossils arrive, the model favors an efficient hydrodynamic body shape, confirming that streamlined bodies win the right to grow large in the ocean. Follow the channel for the latest discoveries and fascinating stories about the ocean's behemoths.